All right, hello everyone. Welcome to this podcast, yet to be named. Which I know, yeah, I know. Gabby is looking at me right now. <laughs> you are not happy because I just said that I would come up with a name, <laughs> and my name is yet to be named. The yet to be named podcast. Okay. Yeah, which that's pretty much what we're gonna work with here. This is something that many people have demanded, and so for those of you who are first time listening, which I mean, I would think that it's your first time listening, considering that this is the first episode. But if you are far in the future and you have come back to this, wow, amazing. <laughs> you have come back to the first episode. You get to see us at our absolute lowest. Well, not actually see us, more like hear us, but you get the idea. Uh, sure. <laughs> okay, I know you're in a lot of pain just hearing me talk right now. Gabby, I have very bad news for you, and that is going <laughs> to continue for hopefully many years to come. Perfect. Love love that. I mean, I'm, I'm excited. Don't get me wrong. Just. Um, you're rambling. Yes. <laughs> that, that That's kind of my entire purpose for my life. So, anyway, let's go ahead and get on to today's topic, the beginning. And I thought that if we're going to talk about something, we need something spicy. We need to have fun with it. And what is more fun than nuclear weapons? Hey, radiation <laughs> is nothing more than spicy air. Uh, okay. Sure. So, okay, we're not going to talk about the finer points of nukes, because honestly, when it comes to talking about nukes, I'm not going to be able to get nearly into much of the technical aspect. This is a history podcast, and so let's just go ahead and talk about some of the near misses, shall we say. Now, there have been a lot of nuclear accidents and issues and problems all over the world, but there are two primary contenders for the big ones. Can I guess? Yeah. The U.S.? Naturally. And the other one? B being? The U.S.S.R. There you go. Okay, good. The Soviet Union, the Russians, the we really do not care about OSHA in any way, shape, or form, <laughs> the Russians. Yes. <laughs> Oh man, they, they got a lot of stories when it comes to a lot of their nuclear problems. But for today's episode, I thought that we would look at almost wars. And this is going to be a part one, because there's a lot of incidents involving nuclear weapons or perceived nuclear activity that could have led to wars. At some point, can we do some almost wars about non-nuclear warfare? Just like people with like swords being like, let's fight, and then they just never do. Yeah, that pretty much happened all over the world throughout all of history. These are just more fun because it involves nuclear weapons. Because what is really the problem with two countries going to war? It's not. Now, if the entire world is at stake, that's some drama. <laughs> because the world could have ended. More. A little more than drama, if you ask me. Okay, so let's let's start this off. We're talking about America, the USSR, and nukes. The almost wars. The almost events that nearly led to war. So, for the sake of today's story, we're going to start off, I'd say at the beginning, in my opinion, is the 5th of November, 1956, which I like to call the coincidence. So... Background for this. It is during the Suez Crisis, the North American Aerospace Defense Command, or NORAD, has received a number of simultaneous reports. Now, a report, any one of these things happening, while it might be something that, say, the U.S. or another power would pay attention to, it doesn't necessarily mean that it is a massive cause for alarm on its own. However, the number of things that occurred, and occurred at the same time, this is not exactly what they would deem a coincidence. This seems like it's a big, big red flag. A lot of red flags. A there's, lot of angry red flags with a little hammer and sickle on them. There's no such thing as coincidence. Remember that. So, first off, they received reports that there were unidentified aircraft that were flying over Turkey. Okay. Well, that's something to be investigated. They, there was already issues with the Soviet Union and Turkey in the first place, so that had to be verified. Second... Soviet MiG-15 fighters were flying over Syria. Okay, also something to pay attention to with the Soviet involvement in the Middle East. Third, a downed British Canberra medium bomber. So, a British bomber suddenly went down. 
How? Well, that's that's something they didn't know. And when a warplane goes down, you don't know if it's been shot down or something else has happened. So that's something that was occurring. And again, all this happened at the exact same time. God forbid they have a random engine failure. And third, at the exact same time that all three things in here was happening, there was unexpected maneuvers by the Soviet Black Fleet through the Dardanelles that appeared to signal a Soviet offensive. Now, for those of you who don't know what the Dardanelles are, this is the Strait of Gallipoli. It's that narrow, natural waterway in northwestern Turkey that forms a part of the, uh, it's the continental boundary between Europe and Asia. So this is what separates Asian Turkey from European Turkey. So it basically looked like Russia was maneuvering down through from the Black Sea, heading it into the Mediterranean. Basically, all of these signs were massive red flags. Literally prior to this, the Soviets had been threatening Britain and France uh, with missile attacks. So all of a sudden, all these military maneuvers looked like, oh crap, the Soviets are launching an offensive. Oh no. So the U.S. forces believed that these events could trigger a NATO nuclear strike against the Soviet Union and then cause an all-out global war. Because if the Soviet have started a massive offensive, and if they're simultaneously invading multiple parts of Europe and the Middle East, it's going to cause an all-out war and immediately create a nuclear situation. But, and here's where it comes to a really big surprise... As it turns out, all of these things were just really dumb coincidences that happened at the exact same time. So first off, uh, that unidentified aircraft, mm -hmm. not aircraft. It was a flock of swans. How did they do this? Listen, early radar and detection was not exactly the best. Imagine being that person and having to tell your boss, oh man, flock of swans. Yeah, so it was a wedge of swans. They were flying over Turkey. Second, those unidentified aircraft, not the unidentified, the Soviet MiG-15 fighters that were going over Syria. Yeah, that was planned. That was a fighter escort for the Syrian president, uh, Shakiri al kuwadi and I'm probably just going to butcher that pronunciation, who was actually returning from a diplomatic mission to Moscow. So that's natural. It was the Soviets literally escorting the Syrian president. That is going to happen. That British bomber went down because of mechanical issues. I knew it. Yeah. Okay, yeah, it, it was mechanical issues, but again, the fact that it occurred at the exact same time as the others gave the impression that it had been shot down. And fourth, those maneuvers, the ones that were happening by the Black Sea Fleet, that was all part of a scheduled exercise for the Soviet fleet that the U.S. just was not aware of. So they just did not know that it was happening. But it ended up all being a coincidence that it just occurred at the same time as all this other crazy crap went on. I just want to say I'm very thankful they investigated before they said full send. Yeah, well, there are many other events to come, and <laughs> the whole investigation is a very crucial part of this that um, some people would rather not have done and just flown off the handle. So let's fast forward a couple years, right? It's 1960. October 5th, 1960, uh, 1960 specifically. Now, remember what we talked about with the swans, how early detection like radar that kind of thing was not exactly the best yes okay so early warning radar had quickly become one of the most important tools of the nuclear age american radar stations were basically built all, all around the world with the hope that they would detect incoming soviet missiles which would in turn warm their respective homelands of a strike allowing for the president to form a response but just like the tech today, things have a tendency to not exactly work out how we plan. I mean, you and I know this from firsthand from literally everything that we do with technology of going through all the effort of setting everything up. It should work exactly how it's supposed to. And then some bull yeah, thing just affects we it. we weren't paid to set up, I'm guessing, multi-million dollar radar. <laughs> Yeah, probably a lot more money than that, considering yeah. what goes into this. I think they should have, you know, covered all their bases on that. <laughs> well, for the bases, that was kind of the problem. They couldn't detect a number of them. So, the the U.S. early warning radar, which was in Thule, Greenland, 
It had actually reported to the North American Air Defense, NORAD, command headquarters, which was in Colorado Springs, that it had detected dozens of Soviet missiles that were launched against the United States. So all of a sudden, this warning comes in. There are many dozens of missiles that are heading our way. For all that the command is concerned, war has basically just started. These missiles were predicted to hit the U.S. mainland in 20 minutes, which naturally caused the entire command center to panic. They went on maximum alert and prepared for war. They were getting ready to launch everything they had going back at the Soviets. Okay, I just want to say that this is giving off some serious Hawaii vibes. Remember when that worker pushed the wrong button, alerted the entire <sighs> island, like all of them, that they were about to be like basically annihilated. Yep. And then it was just an error. Yep. Which, um, the whole thing with an error, this was not necessarily a human one. This was a machine one, as we're going to get into. Uh, so, it, first off, I need to set a little bit of background of this. Very quickly, people started to question whether or not it was actually happening. As for a very crucial reason. That reason being that the Soviet premier, Nikita Khrushchev, like the leader of the Soviet Union, basically... He was visiting New York at the time. So, I, I want you to imagine. Imagine if Biden, who is our current president here in 2021, uh, was just in, I don't know, he was visiting North Korea for whatever reason. I don't know. And then the, the, like the North Koreans just thought that we tried to bomb them. Like, just nuked them. Like, some people might say is a conspiracy theory that we're trying to get rid of them. Um, but that doesn't really make sense. Yeah, I can't see a country turning on their own president in that fashion. Yeah, I was about to say, like, yeah. if you want to talk about historically <laughs> turning against their leaders, there are many, many examples I that go against that. I think there are steps that can be taken before nuclear war. But are they fun? Mm, yes. They don't involve explosions. Yes, they do. Just maybe they're not the nuclear variety. Hopefully. Okay, let's finish the story. <laughs> okay, so again, they started to question this because it didn't really make sense that Khrushchev was actually in America at the same time that the Soviets were trying to bomb them. Uh, so they later determined, looking back at this, because th th they basically stopped. They didn't want to go forth with any kind of plan of bombing because, or rather return bombing, because they didn't know actually what was going to happen here. So they determined later that the radar had been fooled by the moonrise over Norway. So the computers actually misinterpreted the moon going up over Norway as a bunch of missiles. Understandable. And this is actually something that historically, like long past this, you would see a lot more radar and other detection services misinterpret data and create a lot of interesting scenarios uh so besides that next one november 24th 1961 this is literally a year later oh yeah no and they're gonna get closer just wait until 1962 that is this cold war era yeah oh god yeah the, the whole thing again the cold war that could have turned hot at any moment 1962 is... it was not helped by 1962 technology obviously yeah so, on November 24th, 1961, there was a single little switch, a single mechanical failure that nearly sent us to war. So, only a year later, after the previous event, there was a communication failure with the three ballistic missile early warning sites, or BMEWS. This was in Thule, Greenland, Clear, Alaska, and again, I'm going to butcher the pronunciation of this. Flyingdales, England, or it might even be a weird English pronunciation if it's like Feelingdales. I'm actually not sure which. I'm pretty sure it's just Flyingdales or Feelingdales. So anyway, they lost contact with SAC, leaving them with essentially two possibilities. Either enemy action, which had cut off communication of these sites and completely taken them out, or there was some sort of coincidental failure that just knocked out all three sites at the exact same time. Now, it was determined, naturally, like if you would look at the scenario, you would think there is no way that is a coincidence. These are three separate locations in three completely different parts of the world. 
how the hell would they all go down at the exact same time? That's got to be some kind of coordinated attack. Like, if you were looking for a pattern, that is what you would think, right? I would think that there is no way anyone could be that coordinated, but that's just me. I mean, it's the military? There's, they're in different time zones. How on earth would they do a <laughs> coordinated <laughs> attack? That's not... Okay. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, I guess I just don't get it. Okay, so anyway, they believed that the chance that this was just a malfunction was low, uh, and they thought that thus they were under attack. So the SAC's entire alert force uh, was ordered to prepare for takeoff, but crisis was averted when a U.S. bomber managed to actually make contact by radio with Thule and confirm that no attack was actually underway, that everything was fine. So it was later discovered that it was a single malfunctioning switch that managed to shut down all communications, even the emergency hotlines, like the ones between SAC, Thule, and NORAD. So, and here's where it gets dumb. The reason why this occurred was because all lines of communication were ran through a single relay station, which had overheated. That just sounds like poor planning. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's kind of the whole thing with mechanical failure here, where um, it was really dumb where one line... That, it's like, imagine you got a hose, right? And you're connected to all these different sprinklers. You make one kink in that hose, and all the water is completely cut off. And that is basically what happened here. I hope they improved on it since 1961. Well, yeah. Okay, so... That was very clearly just a coincidental failure. That makes sense, right? Um, the next thing, though, as I said, is 1962. Uh, so 1962 was just bad. I I don't even know how to really begin with this here. So, okay, so let's let's basically look at the beginning. Um, now, this first thing is not actually something that almost led to war, but I wanted to talk about it because it really lets you know what the Soviet mindset was like. Like, one of the reasons why they were so on edge. So back in August of 1962, I believe it was uh, August 23rd, the SAC Chrome Dome Airborne Alert Route included a leg from the northern tip of Ellesmore Island across the Arctic Ocean to Barter Island, Alaska. And on August 23rd, 1962, there was a B-52 nuclear-armed bomber crew that made a navigational error and flew 20 degrees too far north, which put them within 300 miles of Soviet airspace near Wrangel Island, where there was believed to be an interceptor base with aircraft having an operational radius of 400 miles. Now, you might wonder, why is that a problem? Why is that a problem? Okay, well, it is a problem because if you have a nuclear weapon on board an aircraft and you are flying within just a couple hundred miles of airspace, of like of someone's national, like sovereign airspace, this means that at any given point, you're just like an hour or less than an hour away from being able to bomb them. You got to think, these planes could fly at well, ridiculous speeds. I don't actually remember what the exact speed of the B-52 bomber for what it was capable of, but it was something that within half an hour to an hour would have been capable of reaching Soviet territory and, well, nuking them to hell. And the only reason that occurred was because of an operational error where it was just a matter of degree. The flight was calculated incorrectly. And so because of the risk of repetition of such an error, in this northern area where other checks of navigation are really difficult to obtain, it was decided to fly a less provocative route in the future. But these orders were not actually given by the time of the Cuban Missile Crisis, which meant that the entire time that the crisis was going down, the Soviet Union knew that there was American planes flying within 300 miles of their territory with nukes on them which gives the impression that we were scouting out or at least in the vicinity, like the area, ready to just bomb them. Yeah, that's not great. That would cause some anxiety. Yeah, it literally looked like we were threatening them. Like, I, if I were them, I would be like, oh no, this is very 
stressful. Like, no. Yeah. So that's what starts there. Now, the Americans also had some issues with this that they thought things were going down. But rather than, say, a continuous event that was going on, the Americans actually had an event back on October 24th, like right before everything basically goes to, well, hell, just a few days later. Um, so on October 24th, a Soviet satellite uh, actually entered its own parking orbit and shortly exploded thereafter. So with the fact that one of their satellites exploded in orbit, it made the U.S. think that the Soviet was launching missiles against their own satellites and that they were basically firing off weapons, trying to knock out American communication. We don't really know what they reacted as because all that information is classified, but nuclear war did not break out, so we can't think that it, they did anything. Let me get this straight. The U.S. thought Russia was taking out their own satellites. No, our satellites. Okay. They, they sent something up there and exploded, and they thought that they were going to be coming after our satellites up there, too. So they started with their own satellites. No, they didn't know that it was a Soviet satellite. They thought okay. they were launching missiles. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. So, again, naturally, war did not break out, so I can't really imagine that the reaction was too severe, though we can't really confirm this because of its classification. So not as severe, but here's where it gets stupid. So... <laughs> Oh, it gets stupid? Um, it's been stupid. No, no, no. Those were kind of like events. This is where it gets legitimately stupid. So, October 25th, 1962, they are barely holding on, right, to their sanity. And we're going to get to that. So, the Cuban Missile Crisis is perhaps the closest the world has ever actually come to nuclear war. Uh, well, global nuclear war at that. So, over the course of about... 13 days there were four instances that really stand out uh and the first one of these occurred on october 25th 1962 again tensions were already high during the crisis and the u.s military was placed on defcon 3 which if you don't know what that is that means that we were two steps away from nuclear war like it was basically bound to happen uh during the cuban missile crisis the u.s military planners were very aware that the Soviet Union might try to sabotage their operations. And that this would precede any nuclear strike. Basically, the idea was that the Soviet Union, if they launched nuclear missiles against the United States, knew that the U.S. would respond in kind with their own nuclear missiles. Thus, all the stations were on high alert for any kind of sabotage. Because naturally you're going to want to remove your enemy's ability to respond to you with force. So if the Soviet Union could knock out our ability to launch nukes, then they would be able to nuke us with no issues. That's not a fair fight. I don't like that. I mean, that, that's basic military strategy. It just makes sense for it here. So this is the mindset that they're approaching here with, right? And around midnight, again, on October 25th, 1962, a guard at the Duluth Sector Direction Center saw a figure climbing the security fence. He shot at it and activated the sabotage alarm, which automatically set off similar alarms at other bases in the region. So, here's the thing. I said similar alarms, not the same ones. At Volk Field in Wisconsin, a faulty alarm system caused the klaxon. The klaxon is the horn there on base, the one that would basically signal go time, like it's attack time. So the wrong horn sounded. Instead of like, hey, alert, it's like, we are starting this. It's go time, now. Um, <laughs> so that happened. Which ordered Air Defense Command nuclear-armed F-106 interceptors into the air. Uh, the pilots were not told anything, right? They hadn't been told that there were any practice drill alerts, and so they firmly believed that nuclear war had started. But before the planes were able to actually take off and go to their designated strike positions, no. the base, I know, it's so close to actually happening. The base commander contacted Duluth and learned that there had been an error. An officer at the command center drove his own car onto the runway, flashing his lights and signaling to the aircraft to stop. Do you know what all this was? What? Well, Tell me. They were barely holding on, right? Yeah. You spelled barely wrong. Oh my. It was a bear. Oh my god. Yeah. You see the notes in there? Yeah. <laughs> it was a bear. A bear was climbing the fence and it got shot 
but before it could be confirmed that it was not a Soviet spy. The wrong was, alarm sounded. The wrong alarm sounded, basically setting the entire base into go time for nuclear war. I cannot imagine living through these actual events because I'm on the edge of my seat listening to it. So there yeah. is absolutely no way I would have survived actually living through it. Yeah, so declassified documents uh, revealed that the incident was so severe that it actually caused the Klaxon system to be completely changed. As like the, it should have been. Yeah, which naturally, I mean, if you're going to almost have a nuclear war, you got to fix your god How, dang alarm system. I, I know nothing about the Klaxon system, but the wrong alarm sounding, it just doesn't sound great if you have the ability to sound the wrong alarm. It sounds very important that they're accurate. Yeah. And we're going to get to the final one here. Oh, there's uh, more. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're gonna get final one here for today, and there's gonna be another one that we're gonna cover because it just it just gets really dumb. I would argue that this last stuff, this is actually the closest that we ever got to global nuclear annihilation. This is actually where it happened, and the reason for it is that these events actually occurred on the same day. As the Klaxon alarm? No, no, no. Oh. Three days or two days later, okay. October twenty seventh. So again, over 13 days, four incidents happened, and these are the next two in that list. So first off, on the morning of October 22nd or 27th, a U-2F reconnaissance aircraft was shot down by the Soviets while it was flying over Cuba, which killed its pilot. This caused tensions to escalate to their highest point. At this point, this might have been just a declaration of war, actually shooting down a enemy aircraft. Uh, and so U.S. Air Force Major Rudolph Anderson Jr. was shot down flying over Cuba. He was later awarded the Distinguished Service Medal posthumously. But this entire time that this is going down, it's the middle of the Cuban Missile Crisis. And I'll probably go over that at a later point. Like, we can have a whole video dedicated to that because that is, that is its own wild saga to actually occur. But later that same day, and we've actually made a video on this, you probably remember here, a Soviet submarine. Oh, I the, love this guy. Yep, yeah, the B-59 was detected trying to break the blockade that the U.S. Navy had established around Cuba. The destroyer, the USS Beale, dropped practice depth charges in an attempt to make the submarine surface. Now, the captain of the B-59, which was Valentin Savitsky, he thought that the submarine was under attack, and he ordered to prepare the nuclear missile, or sorry, the submarine's nuclear torpedo to be launched at the aircraft carrier USS Randolph. Now, background again to all this, and you probably remember from when we covered the video, but yeah. for those of you who are listening, at this time, because the submarine would have no way to contact Moscow, these submarines that were deployed around Cuba were given essentially complete freedom. If they believed that they were under attack, that war had broken out, they were given free use of their ability to use nuclear torpedoes. That sounds dangerous. Yeah. So, all three senior officers aboard the B-59 had to agree in order to launch it before it happened. And two of them, the captain and I believe it was the second in command, or it was the, no, the no. political officer. That's who it was. It was the captain and the political officer both agreed to do it. The second in command, Vasily Arkhipov, who My was favorite. actually, he was actually the dedicated commander of the entire squadron, but he was second in command of this particular submarine. Um, so he actually disagreed with his other two counterparts and convinced the captain to surface and await orders from Moscow. But at that moment, they were literally one step away from turning the key and launching an all-out nuclear war. Do you ever just think about how important that one man was? He literally saved the world. That, I mean, like, that is no joke that this is a one individual who actually saved the entire world. That's amazing. Like, imagine living your life. Yeah, you owe me. Like, yeah. he actually died recently, lived happily ever after with his wife, and I guess I would live happily ever after, too, if I saved the it, entire at world. At first, it wasn't happily ever after, though. The, when he returned back to Moscow, he was disgraced. Really? Yeah, no, the Soviets thought that the whole thing was an embarrassment and wished that he had actually died. He, They wished that he and his crew had just died instead of revealing their position. 
because it was a national embarrassment for them. Oh, that's, that's, I don't like this part of the story. Let's go back. So he was not honored until decades later. I believe it was actually, with everything that was going on, it wasn't until into the 90s with the dissolution of the Soviet Union that all these classified documents from the Kremlin were actually revealed and he got the honor that he deserved. Three decades later, it took over 30 years for him to actually be honored for this. I don't like that, but okay. <laughs> anyway, I say that that is where we're going to end it here for today. Uh, for those of you who have joined us and listened in, I appreciate it. Uh, again, at this point, we don't have a name for this podcast. I'm still trying to determine that. If you have any ideas, message us here on Instagram. Send us notices on TikTok. Comment on YouTube. Yeah, put it on YouTube, which we're going to end up uploading this audio to there. And we're going to probably look at Spotify and other services to put this up on. And if you're listening on any of these things here in the future, then, well, you know exactly what we did. Because, well, we put it on the service of whatever it is that you're actually listening to. So this whole thing that I'm saying now is pointless. But thank you for listening. And I do hope to see you here in the next one. Goodbye, everyone.